Good morning. Oh, give it to me again. Good morning. My name's Paul Brandis. I get to serve here at Sterling College as the chaplain. And, you know, I am so glad that we have Kilborn in the house today. Can, can you, guys, you guys get excited about your dorm? Let's go. Come on. So uh, I lived in Kilborn when I was a student here, so I'm particularly excited to have you all uh, here with us today. Um, we also have a bunch of people that are tuning in on video, so uh, thank you, not live, but we've recorded this, and so if you're watching it later, thanks so much for joining us in that way. We'll have the other Kilborn wing here on Friday, and I know we have a few like non-Kilborn people in the house. Where are you all at? Oh, there's like four of you. It's, that's right. Boo. Okay. Well, hey, thank you so much for gathering with us. Why do we do this? Why do we gather in chapel? Well, it's because we as an organization, we're a, we're a Christian organization, Christ-centered. Uh, Jesus it drives everything we do, and we take the Bible very seriously. And you may not believe this, but we as an organization believe very deeply that Jesus is Lord over all, that he is risen from the grave, that he actually is Lord even over death, and we believe that he is worthy of our worship. And so we gather for, for worship, a response to who God is and what he has done. We sing together, we listen to musical worship, we'll do that in a bit, and we hear God's word preached. So that is why we gather. We've switched up how we are tracking chapel attendance this year. If you're new, I promise you it is about a trillion times better than the way we used to do it. I know it might be annoying to have to get I attended set up, but if you have not done this, you need to because you won't get credit leaving today if you haven't done this yet. So download I attended. You need to create a free account. Uh, and then you need to tie that to your Sterling email. So follow the steps on the screen to do that. Make sure your sterling.edu email is attached to this. Okay, so download it. Hit enter code E122. That's going to ask you to confirm your Sterling email. You're going to want to do that because um, you have to have it to get attendance. So do this, and then, oh, wait, I've got another, I, I've got a dismissal slide, because I want to, yeah, I want to talk through this. So after uh, the benediction at the end of the service, which is our good and final word where I will send you, I'll actually have you guys just kind of sit back down, especially if you're in the middle. Um, what we're going to have is uh, all four of these doors, sets of doors will be wide open, and there will be an iPad with a QR code on it next to each one of these doors. I'll ask you to dismiss safely, right? We're gathering safely, please dismiss safely, so don't. Don't, don't stand in a long line. Just kind of hang tight. I promise this goes quickly and fast. You just walk by. You have your I attended app out. You hit scan code, and you scan the QR code, and you're on your way. If you can't get this set up, if you're having problems with it, if it doesn't work when you try to scan it, I'm going to hang right here, and you should come see me, and we'll get it fixed together. Okay? So make sure you get I attended going. This is how we're going to dismiss at the end. We can go to that listen and learn. Uh, slide now. Um, over the summer, uh, we, a few of us by we, uh, faculty, staff, um, and it was a joint effort from my office, the Office of Spiritual Life, the Office for the Integration of Faith, Faith and Learning, which is run by Dr. Rachel Griffiths, and then our Diversity Task Force. So we have a Diversity Task Force, a Diversity Committee. You'll be here. We've done a ton of stuff over the past year. We believe very deeply in the value of diversity uh, here at Sterling College, and we've believed that for a very long time. We know we have a long way to go. We know we do. In fact, we've done an assessment. We've studied. We know we have a long way to go, uh, but we uh, are excited about what has happened on that committee. You'll be getting more updates. And one of the things that the task force, my office, and Dr. Rachel Griffith's office did is we uh, uh, unveiled the Listen and Learn Challenge. It was one of our responses to what happened in Minneapolis over Memorial Day. We are an educational institution, and we want to put ourselves in a learning posture. So we intentionally select uh, books on relevant topics that are all written by black authors. Um, and we have the list of those books right here. It was The Color of Compromise, The New Jim Crow, Race for Profit, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and I'm Still Here. And we invited uh, students, employees, uh, administrators, uh, friends of the college to read these books with us. And every single one of these books was selected by at least somebody. We had about 40 people jump in with this Listen and Learn Challenge. And as you can see, we have some dates on the screen, we're actually going to uh, have discussions about these books, one-time discussions about these. So if you read one of these, 
Get this on your radar. Get this on your calendar. You'll be hearing from your discussion leader about it. But we wanted to tell everyone about this so that you could be aware that we're carrying through on what we invited people to do this summer in reading these books. And we wanted you to know that this conversation matters to us. It is important to us. Uh, and it is matters and is important because we believe it is grounded in God's word. We, be, we believe that God cares very deeply about these topics and conversations, and so that's why, that's why we have them. So we're really excited about the listen and learn challenge. Bow your heads and pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you um, for the authors that wrote those amazing books, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity that we have, as James talks about in uh, his, his letter in the Bible, James chapter 1, to be quick to hear, be quick and fast to hear and slow to speak. That's what we wanted to do this summer, Lord, is place ourselves in a listening, humble posture uh, and, and, and uh, turn ourselves to, to books that are written by black authors. And so thank you for the Listen and Learn Challenge. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful I personally benefited from reading those books this summer, Lord, and I know others in our community did. I pray for those conversations, the book discussions that will happen. I pray, Father, for our entire campus related to the conversation around race and diversity, the work that the Diversity Task Force will continue to do. Bless that work, Lord. Bless all of our students as we navigate this difficult and challenging year together. As we turn now to your word, Father, I pray that I would decrease and I pray that you would increase. I pray, Father, for the students that are here, for the students and others that might be watching later on video. Uh, be with each one of us, Father. We, we know that you have something for us, and so help us to be focused and, and engaged with this time. We're really grateful for your word that we can turn to and, and learn from. We need that, God. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I want, to be, I want to be honest with you guys this morning. I really do. I really want to be honest with you. And, and, and I had a moment, I had a moment in the past few months where I was terrified. I mean, I was really, really scared. Incredibly worried. It was one of those moments, and... And maybe you've had them too, where the anxiety is so intense that it actually manifests in some pretty intense physical ways. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Your, your palms are sweaty. Your heart is racing. You can't calm down no matter what you do. I had one of these moments in the last few months. I just didn't think it was going to come through. And then... Well, then Patrick Mahomes did this. Chiefs need some Mahomes magic. Launches down the middle. Hill open. Caught. And they get it. Kansas City, the big play. Is that, just, is that just me, right? Right, Mahomes magic indeed, right? Now that's incredible. Now if you're not a Chiefs fan, I get it. That could be qualified as cruel and unusual punishment. How many of you are mad at me that I showed you that right now, right? Do we have any 49er fans in the house here? Okay, so that's really mean. So if you're not a Chiefs fan, you're mad right now, right? But I am a Chiefs fan. We lived in Kansas City for the last five years before we came back here to Sterling. And before that pass... Before that pass, that was my freak out moment, right? I was scared. I was terrified. I'm on the edge of my seat in my living room. My heart is racing. They're down 10 with less than eight minutes to play, right? Come on. How many of you play football here? They're not coming back from that. And then he hit that pass. And, and, and the fear and anxiety, didn't, it didn't completely go away, right? They still had to score, stop, score, right, which, which they did, right? But in that moment, the anxiety lessens, Third and 15, y'all. Third and 15, and he gets that pass off to Tyreek Hill. Mahomes, magic indeed. I was freaking out before that. I was worried. But that's not exactly what I want to talk about today, right? Sports worry is a real thing. Can I get an amen in the house? You're all right, yeah. We all know you're watching your team and you have sports worry. I don't know if anybody else has called it that. That's what I'm calling it, sports worry. And maybe it's not just your favorite team. Maybe it's the team you play on, right? 
Sports worry, it's a real thing. But what I want to talk about today is a different type of worry. Sports worry is real. It's hard when your team loses, I get that. But I want to talk about a different type of worry today. A different type of anxiety. One that cuts a little deeper and one that runs a little harder. Because I'll continue to be honest with you this morning, and there's no, there's no football clip on the other side of this. I'll continue to be honest with you this morning, if you'll allow me. I personally have found the last few months to be really, really difficult. In the midst of this strange and uncertain moment, I have experienced higher amounts of worry and anxiety than are normal for me. Everyone gets stressed, everyone gets worried at times, but in the past few months, I have experienced higher amounts of that than are normal or typical for me. I've been worried about the college and whether or not we were going to reopen in person again and whether we'd be safe as we did that. I've been worried about my family. I said last week, my, my wife Ashley is expecting again. We're having our third kid. There's, there's a lot to worry about with that. I want her to be safe. I want the baby to be safe. I, I want to know that I'm going to be able to provide for them. Three kids is a lot. There's more of them than there are of us now. I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried about you all. I know that these past few months have been so difficult for each and every one of us, and I care about all of you deeply. So I'm worried about you. My list of anxieties in this moment is not short. And I wonder if I'm not alone in that. Maybe that resonates with you as you think about your past few months. Maybe your list of worries and anxieties is a little bit longer than it normally is. And so I'm grateful that the Lord has drawn my heart to a particular couple of verses in his Bible this morning. I want to share them with you. And I don't know what your opinion is on the Bible, but if you have struggled at all with worry or anxiety in this season or in any other, then I want to invite you on a journey with me this morning. Let's enter into God's word and discover together if we find anything there that's helpful for the battle that I'm sure we're facing against worry and anxiety. I want to take us this morning to the New Testament book of Philippians. The New Testament book of Philippians. Now, this book is a letter that is written by the Apostle Paul, who was one of the earliest followers of Jesus. And Jesus put Paul on a mission to travel around most of the known world at that moment in time. And as he traveled, he met people that he led to Jesus, and he started a bunch of churches. He took the message of Jesus far and wide. And, and Paul cared about the people in these churches so deeply, and so he stayed in touch with them. Not only because he cared about them and loved them, but also because they had many, many struggles, challenges, worries, and anxieties. You see, the earliest followers of Jesus, they suffered mightily in many different ways. It was stressful. It was worrisome to be a follower of Jesus in the first century. These people, they experienced intense an understandable anxiety because of their circumstances. And I'm sure that they often wondered if following Jesus was really worth it. I'm sure that thought crossed their minds time and time again. Is this worth it? I'm counting the cost of following Jesus and I'm just not so sure because it is so hard. Well, Paul believed it was worth it. And so he wrote letters to these churches who were struggling and suffering and it's fascinating to me because actually the theme, the main theme of the letter that we're going to look at this morning, Philippians, the main theme is actually joy. The main theme is joy. Read through the five chapters, the four chapters that you'll find, not five, four chapters that you'll find in the book of Philippians and just circle joy, joyful, delight. You circle that in that book, you're going to be circling probably almost 20 times. The main theme that Paul comes back to over and over and over again is joy. Paul invites the Philippians to still pursue a life of joy even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Now hold on a second with me. Because Paul is not advocating for blind happiness that ignores real problems. Don't hear me saying that and don't hear him saying that. Paul isn't like, stick your head in the sand and just pretend your life's not hard. You can be happy that way. That's not what he argues for. That's not what he talks about. He does, though, believe that it is possible to experience deep joy 
and contentment even when times are hard. And Paul knew hard times. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. Three times the dude was shipwrecked. Not once, not twice. Three times he was shipwrecked. Left for dead. Had to sneak out of cities because people wanted to kill him. He had a hard life. And even in the midst of that, he says, it's not blind happiness, but I have found the secret to being content and joyful. That's what he writes about in the book of Philippians. He doesn't offer a magic solution to achieve this. There's not a magic pill that he says, hey, dude, take this, pop that, it'll be great. No. And yes, sometimes medication is a part of all of that, but but Paul's not advocating for something magic here in this moment. He knows how complicated life is and how hard it can be, but he writes at length in Philippians and in other places about what results from a life that is oriented around God. And in Philippians 4, he addresses the topics of worry and anxiety, worry and anxiety directly. He comes at these directly. And this is what he says. Let's pick it up. Philippians 4 at the end of verse 5. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Sit in those verses with me for a second. Again, I don't know what your opinion is of the Bible, what your view is of the Bible, but just sit in those verses with me. Read them again right now. Let me read verse 7 again slowly. And the peace of God which transcends, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, will guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Does that not sound incredible? I read these words from the Apostle Paul in the Bible and my heart, my soul aches for them. There's something deep inside me that reads this and says, I want it. I want that. The peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I love that image, that image of guard. You know, it it, it makes me think of the tomb of the unknown soldier. This is in Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, and in front of this iconic and vitally important tomb that honors unknown soldiers who have fallen in battle. A member of the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment stands guard 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, rain or shine, hailstorm, hurricane, does not matter. There is a soldier that is guarding this tomb every single hour of the day. Guard, protect, shelter, shield. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Does that not sound good? Does that not sound like something that you would want, that you would desire? So how do we? That's the question, right? How do we get peace? How do we get peace? Let's enter back into these verses and look closely at them. Let's discover what we'll find. First, how do we get peace? Believe that the Lord is near. Believe that the Lord is near. And this comes right from the end of verse 5. It's very straightforward. Paul says, the Lord is near. The the Lord is near. Matter of fact, boom, period. The Lord is near. But we need to ask this morning, we have to ask, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by this simple and compact statement? The Lord is near. What does he mean? Well, think about how we use the phrase or the word near in a couple of different options. Think about this with me. If I say Labor Day is near, you know that I mean that Labor Day is coming up this weekend. You know that it is temporally near to us. Labor Day is near. The time of it is coming. It is near to us temporally. That's one way we use this word, we use this phrase. But think about this. What if my wife Ashley says, the dog is too near to me? which sometimes she does because our dog is a six-pound shih tzu. 
uh, that is super clingy to Ashley and sort of like annoys the heck out of her. So she says, the dog is too near. Well, she doesn't mean temporally. She doesn't, she's not talking about time. She means physically and spatially, the dog's too close to her. Get out of here, right? So we use this in a couple different ways, and I think that Paul leaves this phrase ambiguous because he wants to communicate both of them. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. I think Paul means both. I think he means the Lord is close to you, spatially close to you. Now, obviously, you look around, like, well, where's God, right? But God is spirit. God is everywhere. And so God is close to you. One of my most often used verses that I go to time and time again, I share this with people over and over again, is Psalm 34, 18. And the same word, near, close, the same words in that verse too. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Near, near, close, near. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. What Paul is saying in Philippians 4, 5, what the author of this psalm is saying in verse in 34, 18, is that the Lord moves close to those who are broken. The Lord moves close to those who are suffering. The Lord moves close to those who are going through hard times. And I know it actually often feels like the opposite, doesn't it? I know that. I don't want to minimize that at all. When we're going through hard times, doesn't it, it actually kind of often feels like the Lord's very far away. Like, where the heck are you, God? If you were close to me, this wouldn't be happening. I know that it can feel that way. I know it can. I've felt that in my own life. You might be feeling that right now. You're going through a hard time. You're like, the Lord's not close to me. What the heck? I understand that that's how it can feel, but the testimony of Philippians 4, 5, the testimony of Psalm 34, 18 and other places in our Bible is that the Lord, his heart breaks for the brokenhearted and he moves close. He moves close. So the Lord is near. He's close. But I think that Paul wanted to communicate as well the other way that we use the word near you see, Christians believe that we are living between the two comings of Jesus. He came 2,000 years ago. Praise be to God, Jesus came. And Christians believe that we are waiting now for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So when Paul says the Lord is near, I think he means the Lord's return is close in time. You might be going, well, that was, the, he wrote this like 2,000 years ago. Paul doesn't understand how time works. It's been like a couple thousand years, right? But it's closer today than it was yesterday. It's closer in this second than it was last second. We draw nearer and nearer and we wait with anxious anticipation for the second coming of Jesus. And maybe that weirds you out. Maybe you're like, I don't like thinking about Jesus coming back. I don't like what is going on with that. It actually offers me a lot of comfort. I rest in the fact that Jesus is coming back. That his return is near, like Paul says. And I rest in that, and here's why. Here's why I rest in that. Here's why it brings me comfort. It's because when Jesus comes back, everything wrong is going to be made right. When Jesus comes back, everything wrong is going to be made right. Every war will be ended. Every bully will be defeated. Everything sad will come untrue. Every tear will be wiped away. That will be a good day. A good day indeed. So this is good news for Paul. The Lord is near. Jesus is coming back. He's going to make everything wrong, right. Jesus is close to you. He's close to you if you are suffering, if you are struggling. He is there. I know it may not feel that way, but he is there. This is good news for Paul, and it encourages him. And he encourages the Philippian Christians with it, and I want to encourage you with it this morning. To get the peace of God, first believe that the Lord is near. And when I say believe, I mean believe. Believe. When we hear that, we're like, oh yeah, I kind of like mentally agree with that. 
but I mean believe with your entire life. Build your entire life around the truth, around the promise that Jesus is near to you, around the promise that Jesus will return one day and flip all the bad stuff upside down. Make your entire life centrally focused on those truths and on those promises. I don't mean just mentally agree with something. I mean orient your entire life. Bake yourself in this. Just pour it all over you. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. And this is a good thing that should encourage me. Believe that the Lord is near. Believe that the Lord is here, near. But he keeps going. Paul keeps going. How do we get peace? How do we get peace? Wrestle with God in prayer. Believe that the Lord is near. Wrestle with God in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, again, do not be anxious about everything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Notice with me first the word every. Paul says, in every situation that we should pray, presenting our request to God. Now, this does not literally mean that we have to pray nonstop, 100% of the time. Like you're never doing anything else. You're not in class, you're not at practice, you're just sort of in your room praying. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. But I do think this means pray in every situation. I do think this means none of us probably pray enough. I do think this means none of us probably pray enough. Listen, if we're interested in getting peace, the peace of God, then Paul is very clear. One of the most important things we need to do is pray more. Pray more. Every situation. Every situation. A stressful test. Pray. Difficulty with your roommates or your teammates. Pray. Frustration with a coach, an activity director, a professor. Pray. Parents aren't getting along. Pray. Family member has fallen ill. Pray. You're feeling lonely and isolated. Pray. You're struggling with direction. You don't know what to do, where to go. Pray. And on and on and on. Pray. Every situation. Pray. Now, let me be clear. Prayer isn't like rubbing a magic lamp and getting a genie. I, this isn't Aladdin we're talking about here. Robin Williams is not, pop, or Will Smith, right, is not popping out to answer your wishes. This is not prayer. That's not what prayer is. It's not. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to wrestle with God in prayer. In a different letter to a different church, he talks about this is in the book of 2 Corinthians. He talks about how he wrestled with God repeatedly in prayer and he pleaded over and over and over again for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. We don't know what the thorn was exactly, but I don't like thorns to you. That's probably not a good thing. He's pleading with God. He's wrestling with God for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. And in that moment, for some reason, Paul doesn't explain it, God says no. God says, no. God says, no, I will not remove the thorn in your flesh. So even for the Apostle Paul, who had, I promise, he had a more robust prayer life than you and I do. We should aim for how much Paul prayed. But even he, even he was occasionally told no by the Father in the Father's wisdom. So prayer is not magic. We don't control God. Nobody controls God. Nobody controls God. Prayer, prayer is conversation. Prayer is communion. Prayer is relationship building. Prayer is wrestling. I think that's a really good word for prayer, especially in seasons of struggle. I think wrestling is a good word to describe authentic prayer with God. It's close, intimate, intense. Especially when we're in a season of struggle, our prayers to God should look like a wrestling match. That's what we see over and over and over again in the book of Psalms. This is what we see elsewhere in the Bible. If you watched chapel last week, I took us to the book of Lamentations. What is the book of Lamentations if it is not a wrestling match in prayer with God? So whatever you're going through, whatever you're holding, bring it to God and wrestle with him about it in fervent, honest prayer. Yell at him. Cry to him. Pour your heart out to him. Wrestle with God in prayer. He wants all of you. 
all of who you are and all that you have. He knows anyway. Bring it to him. Lay it down. Wrestle with God in prayer. And if you can, if you can, do it with, with a touch of thanksgiving. Do it with, with a touch of thanksgiving. Did you notice that in the verses? Present your request to God with thanksgiving. Present your request to God with thanksgiving. Listen, I get it. When things are hard, it can be tough to turn to God with any sense of thanksgiving. You might be so mad at him that doing so seems impossible. I don't want to minimize that. You may be so confused and upset that offering prayer to God with thanksgiving just seems like something you cannot do right now. But I do want to point out, I do want to point out that these followers of Jesus, they were going through a heck of a hard time. A heck of a hard time. And Paul still instructs them to approach God in prayer, to wrestle with God in prayer with thanksgiving. I've tried to make this a practice in my prayers regularly. Like I said, I've been, I've been struggling myself. I've been pouring out my heart in honesty to God about the difficulty of these past few months. But I have also tried to keep in my mind all that I have to be thankful for. And when I start to make a list, it often end up, ends up being longer than I anticipated. So I'm wrestling with God in prayer constantly about everything. And I'm trying to do it with a sense, with a strong sense of all that I have to be thankful for. This is where I'm at in my journey and you've already heard me this morning. I do genuinely believe that it is a good thing that the Lord is near to me. I, I try to work that into my life as deeply as I can. So I'm praying with fervency. I'm wrestling with God in prayer. I'm being honest with him. I am doing it as much as I can with a sense of thanksgiving. I believe that it's good that the Lord is near. But even doing these things consistently over the summer, this is me. Even doing these things consistently over the summer, I still battled a gnawing anxiety. For that welling up in my chest, heart racing, I still battled that. If it's okay, I want to continue to be honest with you this morning. I knew that this was a higher amount of anxiety for me than normal, so, so I pursued some counseling. I pursued some counseling. And you know what? It's been really helpful. Uh, counseling wasn't magic either. <laughs> there is nothing magic for the hard things of life. Counseling wasn't magic either, but it was so helpful. And I, I did this, I pursued this based on the recommendation and encouragement of my wife, based on the recommendation and encouragement of my parents. You know, I'm in my 30s, I still call my mom and dad. I'm like, hey, I'm not doing so hot. Will you join me in wrestling in prayer? Will you pray for me? And in conversation with my wife, with my parents, with other close friends, as I was honest with them, I was like, yeah, this might be a good step in this season to pursue some counseling. I bring this up because I think it's vitally important. It is okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to need help. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to seek help. I did, and I'm so glad that I did. Prayer is foundational. Belief that the Lord is near is vital. But they are but a part of an overall picture of health and flourishing. And all of us, all of us, at different points need help. It's okay to not be okay. And maybe you're here this morning and you're struggling more than you've admitted to anyone else but yourself. Maybe you're watching with us on video and that describes you. You are struggling more than you've admitted to anyone else. You've kept it tucked inside. You're not okay, but you haven't told anyone else that you're not okay. Maybe that describes you this morning. Please, I urge you, reach out for help. Get in touch with me. Get in touch with our campus counselor, Lydia Butner. Talk to your RA, talk to your RD, talk to, 
Jason Breyer, talk to your coach, your activity director, a professor. One of my favorite parts of the New Testament is this little line in the book of Galatians where the Apostle Paul, he was a really smart guy that wrote a lot of really smart things. He says, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Paul knew how hard life could be. Paul didn't try to bear it on his own. Paul knew that it was okay to not be okay. Paul needed help. He wrote the letter of Philippians because he needed to thank them for the help that they had given him. Bear one another's burdens. It's okay to not be okay. So first, believe that the Lord is near. Second, wrestle with God in prayer and get the help that you need. Get the help that you need. Here's our final idea as we close. Check yourself. Do I have peace with God? Do I have peace with God? Philippians 4, 7 talks about the peace of God. The peace of God which surpasses understanding and guards your heart, which is beautiful. And I imagine, again, that it's something that we all want. But let's step back for a moment and let's step out of the book of Philippians because I think that we need to check ourselves. What do I mean? Well, here's the story of the world in two minutes. The story of the world in two minutes. God created all things good, including the first humans, Adam and Eve, and they had, oh, they had, they had a peaceful and unbroken relationship with God, but tragically. But tragically, they then rebelled against God. They invited, they threw the door wide open to death and brokenness. And in the process, they shattered that once perfect, peaceful relationship with God. Where there once was peace, there was now enmity. They lost friendship with God and they became his enemies. And then... Every single human being thereafter was born an enemy of God and then we proved it with our own rebellion and rejection of God and his ways. We willingly walked onto the battlefield and waged war against God. That is true for you and it is true for me. It is true for all except for one. Jesus Christ lived the perfect life of peace with God that we were all supposed to live and didn't. Jesus Christ was never God's enemy. Jesus Christ was always God's son. And then, have you ever seen a lopsided trade in your fantasy league or in real life? Have you ever seen a lopsided trade? Jesus is the architect, the architect of the most lopsided trade in all of human history. Because Jesus offered up his life as a trade for our life, for your life, for my life. That is the most lopsided trade to ever take place. He traded, he offers to trade his perfection for our failures. He offers to trade his clean record for our rap sheet. Jesus offers to trade his peace with God for our war. And all we have to do to accept this insane trade is to place our faith in, faith in him. Trust in him instead of in yourself or anything else and the trade takes place. Put your faith in Jesus and you are saved. Put your faith in Jesus and you are justified. Put your faith in Jesus and then you have peace with God. Here it is again from the Apostle Paul in a different letter to a different church. Romans 5.1. Here it is. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Jesus instead of in yourself. Trust in Jesus instead of anything else. And you are granted the trade of Jesus' peace with God. And listen, if you don't first have peace with God, I don't know about the peace of God. Peace with God comes before the peace of God. And if my choice is to be an enemy of God waging war with him on the battlefield or to be a child of God who is at peace with him, cozied up in the living room, I want to lay down my weapons and I want to go to the living room. I want to have peace with God and in that space of God's living room, I want to experience the peace of God. Do you want that? If you don't know if you have that, come speak with me. I would love nothing more than to talk about that with any of you.
peace with God. And then the peace of God, right? Philippians 4, 5 through 7, one more time. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about everything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's wrestle with God in prayer right now. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we wrestle with you. We come before you. I know things are hard and difficult and challenging in this moment. I don't know the stories of all of these people that are here today, but I love them and my heart goes out to them. I invite them into this wrestling with you, God. I invite them into this moment where we are asking for peace with you. If we don't have it already, we are asking for the peace of you to come upon and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We want your peace, God. Help us to have it. May we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ and may we pray without ceasing and may we believe that you are near as we walk this journey together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this time. In Christ's name, amen. Well, worship is gonna look a little bit different this semester. We're gathering safely and we wanna make sure that we do this part safely as well because musical worship is an incredibly important part of our worship gatherings. And I'm so glad to have some of your fellow students here behind me. We've got a couple of songs for you this morning. One of those is going to be observational worship. We are observing the beauty of these songs and it is part of our response to how good God is and the good that he does. So for the first song, the observation, I'm going to ask you to just remain seated. Just remain seated, read the words, pray, wrestle with God in prayer right now and let the band play and sing and lead over you. The second song is going to be participatory. So Modine will ask you to stand And then we're actually going to ask you to sing if you're comfortable with that. Please keep your masks on during that part as we're singing. So we'll have an observational song and a participatory song. And then I'll come back up with a benediction and we'll send you from this place to get you on your way to class. I appreciate each and every one of you. And I'm glad that the band's here. You guys can take it away.
generations in your family and your children and your children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children I know, I know what time it is. Remember, if you are ever late to a class because of chapel, you just blame that right on me, right? Don't abuse that, please. <laughs> but if you're ever late to a class because of me, you blame that on me. But let's just, in, like for a moment, right? He is with you. He is with you. He is with you. The very center of Psalm 23, which I closed last chapel in prayer with, right? We don't have to fear the darkest valley. Why? Because he is with us. He is with us. His presence to go with you, around you, before you. And this morning, I actually want to send you with the same benediction that I used last week because it ties the weeks together. Romans 12, 12, another brilliant verse from the Apostle Paul. And he says this, he says, Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in hardship. And be constant in prayer. Be constant in wrestling with God in prayer. Hey, if you're one of the RAs that's helping me, you can kind of get these doors open and get the iPads. Dismiss safely this morning, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I am grateful for each of you. I love each of you. You can go now in peace. Well, hey, everybody, thank you for engaging with chapel today over video. We know it's different to have to do it in this way. We, with, we wish all of you could have been here in person, but I'm so glad to our communications department uh, who helped us record and edit and, and, and film this and get it up and running. Uh, and I'm going to give you credit for this, of course. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it with a video and no credit. We want you to still be able to achieve your chapel credits. So maybe you're watching this video uh, in the app. Uh, you watch it for the required amount of time. You back out. Remember that there is going to be a question for you to answer at the end of that uh, that will ensure that you engage with the video the whole way through. Similarly, I have a code for you this morning. So if you're watching on YouTube, you want to open your I Attended app and then you want to enter this code. So click the gray enter code button and you want to enter the code K as in kite, R as in robot, A as in apple, 
R as in robot, K-R-A-R is today's code. And remember, it is going to ask you a question that ensures you engage the video all the way through. So you can't just jump to the end and grab the code because you won't know the answer to the question. I'm not looking to trick anyone with those questions, but we do want to uh, ensure and guarantee that you're actually engaging and watching chapel. Um, thanks so much again for joining us in this way. If you've got any questions, my email is paul.brandis at sterling.edu. Thank you.